Good morning, and welcome to St. Petronel. Today we celebrate the 26th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The celebrant for this Mass is Father Thomas Meloda, our pastor, assist assisted by Deacon John Spezio. The processional hymn may be found in the hymnal, number 634, We Praise You, O God, number 634. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. As we come to celebrate these sacred mysteries, we give thanks to God for all the blessings he has given to us, including this beautiful day. And so let us prepare room in our hearts, calling to mind the times we have sinned, and asking the forgiveness of our loving Father <clears throat> in heaven. You were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen.
Let us pray. O God, who manifest your almighty power above all by pardoning and showing mercy, bestow, we pray, your grace abundantly upon us and make those hastening to attain your promises heirs to the treasures of heaven. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of Numbers. The Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Taking some of the spirit that was on Moses, the Lord bestowed it on the 70 elders. And as the spirit came to rest on them, they prophesied. Now two men, one named Eldad and the other Medad, were not in the gathering, but had been left in the camp. They too had been on the list, but had not gone out to the tent. Yet the spirit came to rest on them also, and they prophesied in the camp. So when a young man quickly told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp, Joshua, son of Nun, who from his youth had been Moses' aide, said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses answered him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the people of the Lord were prophets. Would that the Lord might bestow his spirit on them all. The word of the Lord. To God. Oh, 
A reading from the letter of St. James. Come now, you rich, weep and wail over your impending miseries. Your wealth has rotted away. Your clothes have become moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded. And that corrosion will be a testimony against you. It will devour your flesh like a fire. You have stored up treasure for the last days. Behold, the wages you withheld from the workers who harvested your fields are crying aloud, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and pleasure. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the righteous one. He offers you no resistance. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. At that time, Jesus said, John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we tried to prevent him because he does not follow us. Jesus replied, Do not prevent him. There is no one who performs a mighty deed in my name who can at the same time speak ill of me, for whoever is not against us is for us. Anyone who gives you a cup of water, because you belong to Christ, amen, I say to you, will surely not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were put around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed than with two hands to go into Gehenna, into the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life crippled than with two feet to be thrown into Gehenna. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Better for you to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into Gehenna, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. The Gospel of the Lord.
The day after I was ordained a priest 29 years ago, I offered my first Mass of Thanksgiving. And at the end, the priest traditionally offers a few words of thank you to those who have meant so much to him throughout his life. As I began to address my family, I got choked up. And so in a misguided attempt to break the logjam of my emotions, I blurted out, my sister is sitting in the second pew and she needs a husband. <laughs> of course, my sister was bright red and climbing under the pew and all the priests, there were 50 priests, they're all turned around. To look at the poor girl, she's never spoken to me again. <laughs> Immediately after the ceremony, however, she had numerous offers, all which she turned down. It seems more and more these days that living a celibate life has become the norm. I feel for those of you who are married because you undoubtedly feel left out. Now let me be clear. I want you all to know that although my lifestyle is the norm these days, I want you to know that I empathize with the pressures you married people feel because you are not celibate. Yeah, it's, it's supposed to be funny, so. My friends, after all, love is love. And I admire the courage some of you possess in choosing to get married in the face of such mounting societal pressures to be celibate. I empathize with the struggles you must have being in the minority. Since I, being a celibate person, am in the majority, I thought I would let you know that some of us celibates do respect your decision to be married. I often stand up for you when I'm in a group of friends telling them, no, married people are not strange just because they are married. You used to see married people all over the place, all the time, walking the streets openly not thinking a thing about it, and perhaps one day they will allow married people to be celibate. So we just have to be patient with them. Okay, well, you figured it out. I'm playing a little devil's advocate with you, or did you really think I had lost my mind? So what is my point? My point to you is, in fact, contained in some questions. Is married love the only way that a person can love? Is married love the only way that a person can be fulfilled? Is personal fulfillment the purpose of love? Does love have rules? or at least boundaries? And if so, from where do those rules of love come? I can remember being over for dinner at a married couple's home for some years ago. They were good friends. And so they felt very comfortable asking me all kinds of very personal questions. And we were talking about celibacy and marriage. And the mom of the household felt so bad for me that I would never be physically intimate with a woman. Please pardon the language because I'm trying to be sensitive to little ears. Of course, I had great respect for them being good friends, but their limited view of love baffled me. Is the most profound expression or only profound expression of love the physical intimacy between husband and wife? If this is the case, 
then Jesus, the Blessed Mother, and Mother Teresa are in deep trouble. Love has been in the news lately, hasn't it? And it is interesting to me that we so readily set aside the teaching of the one who invented love, the one who is love, and instead readily embrace the definition of love determined by a world that so often chooses hate over love and treats the human person as an expendable commodity. Our Lord rather crudely makes the point to his disciples in the gospel reading today that nothing else in our life is more important than choosing heaven and teaching those entrusted to our care to choose heaven above all else. Our Lord mitzes no words, does he? Whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were put around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. The Lord of love said that. So maybe it's time to look at what our backward, patriarchal, and judgmental church believes about love. And let's see if any of these principles are those you would want your children to know about love. First, Love endures, right? St. Paul tells us that love endures. Love is the one thing that lasts forever. We usually reduce love to a feeling, right? An impulse felt inside to, of us to move us in a certain direction. Although our attraction to a person may indeed be an impulse or a feeling, this is not what sustains the relationship, as we all well know. Anyone, certainly, who has loved knows that. You see, feelings come and go, but love endures. So that means that love is not a feeling. Love is a virtue, and the more we practice this virtue, the stronger it becomes, and it endures through good times and bad, like a person's marriage vows say. Second, love is unitive. When we love another person, we are united with that person. In fact, this is what heaven is. Heaven is when you and I are united perfectly with the all-merciful, all-powerful, all-loving, all-knowing, ever-existing God. That's heaven. This is emulated in human relationships and why we human be beings do things like hug people that we love. A hug is a physical expression of this union of love. A husband and a wife are intimate with one another, not because that intimacy is love, but because it is an expression of their love that already exists. Notice, the union of lovers begins not with the physical intimacy, but the sacramental bond which God first placed between them. Third, love is complete and total self-giving. Another way to say this is that love is sacrificial. A person who loves another person gives themselves to that other person. Please notice that this happens in numerous ways which go beyond physical intimacy. A husband shows his love for his wife by moving to a place where she can take her job promotion. Father Jesus showed his love for St. Patronel Parish when he left his previous assignment and came here. A parent gets up in the middle of the night to console their child. A parent sends their child away to college, even though they will miss them terribly. That's love, and it's a sacrifice. Four. Love is good, is for the good of the other, not for self-fulfillment. The most profound act of love is when one person gives their life for the other, no? Although the act of loving may, be, may perfect the individual, 
who is doing the loving. Love is never sought for their own self-gratification. Quite on the contrary, we call using another person for the fulfillment of my own desires objectification of the other, manipulation, and just plain old selfishness. No? Further, we seek not simply the good of the other, but the ultimate good of the other. A parent exhorts their child away from the job that will destroy their soul, even though it may be financially lucrative. Above success, a parent desires that their child be happy, right? And above happiness, a parent desires for their child eternal joy. Today, we seem often to believe that love means telling the other person that everything about them is wonderful. The truth of the matter is that a person who loves you and wishes your best good is going to tell you the truth even if you don't want to hear it. A lover tells you what you need to hear not just what you want to hear. Fifth, love creates life. God is love. Because God is love, he created all that is. The love of the Holy Trinity is so complete that they are a one substance and this triune God creates. A husband and wife, then, share in the divine creative will by loving each other and creating life, even if they cannot have their own children but choose to adopt or cannot have children. The love a celibate priest has for his parish is creative sacramentally by creating children of God through baptism and the other sacraments. A committed single person's love is creative by their example of God's love in the workplace or their generosity and service. Think Dorothy Day. When God tells his priest or the nun or the committed single person that they are not to be married, this is not out of spite. This is not a burden, but an invitation to the celibate, to the single person, to seek the manner in which God is inviting them to give themselves to another and exercise the creative divine will. Yes, my friends, sometimes God chooses not to call a person to marriage. And that's okay. Because what the Lord does in that moment is not asking them not to love or be loved. God is inviting the person to love more, not less. Love is faithful. Since God created love, a necessary requisite for love is faith. You must know the person you love. Married couples know this. Faithfulness is also a boundary, right? You might say, a rule. Faithfulness places a limit on someone, especially a husband or wife. If you love someone, you are faithful to them. You want your spouse to be faithful to you. When a spouse is unfaithful, this is the most profound betrayal of love What we do not often think about is that faithfulness is not just faithfulness to the other person, however. It is also faithfulness to the one who is the source of all love, the one who placed that love in your heart, who gave you that gift. The promise you made on your wedding day is not just faithfulness to your husband or your wife. You also made a commitment to God, the giver of the gift. 
Just as your commitment to your spouse places a limitation on you, so does your commitment to God place a limit on you, even if you don't feel like it. My friends, my sister ended up getting married and having two children. But God told me that marriage was not for me. I'm not angry at him for it, because I know that he was inviting me to love more perfectly, and I thank him every day for that gift. He invited me to a life filled with love that is self-giving, self-sacrificing, faithful, creative, and a love that is eternal. But I also don't feel sorry for you, that you cannot live my life, because I am sure he has called you to faithful, self-giving, creative, and enduring love as well. Oh, a subtext. My friends, after millennia, no, not after millennia, after, since the moment time was invented, God knows something about love. And he's been trying to teach it to us for, for a few thousand years now. One day we might figure it out. Recently, there was a vote by a local high school school board. And it came to light that some members of the board were coerced by their employers, threatening to fire them unless they voted contrary to Catholic teaching. I'm not sure when it was that corporations got into the business of defining love or even church doctrine. But forgive me if I continue to follow the one who creates love. And I hope none of you are living under such tyranny. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit, was incarnate to the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He is ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds in the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With faith and hope in the love of our Heavenly Father, we turn to him with these prayers and petitions. For the shepherds of the church, that they may lead with truth, wisdom, and mercy, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For civil leaders, that they may enact laws which uphold the dignity of the human person from conception to natural death, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to religious persecution and terrorism, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. That Christian families will be strengthened to face every challenge and difficulty and to grow in holiness, 
We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For an increase in vocations to the priesthood and religious life, especially from St. Petronel Parish, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the poor, suffering, the lonely, and the sick, especially Bob Malachar, Father Thomas Botheroid, Joan Loesch, Teresa Pecoraro, that they may know the love of Jesus, and we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those who have died, they may sleep in the presence of Christ, especially Mary Conrad, Father Richard Castells, Joyce Strano, and we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for the intention of this Mass, Ron Budzinski, and we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you grant all these prayers through Christ our Lord. Amen. The hymn for the offertory in preparation of the gifts is found in the hymnal, number 828, In Christ There Is No East or West, number 828. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands to the praise and glory of his name for our good and the good of all his holy church. 
Grant us, O merciful God, that this our offering may find acceptance with you, and that through it the wellspring of all blessing may, le- may be laid open before us, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, for in you we live and move and have our being. And while in this body, we not only experience the daily effects of your care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. And so with the angels, we praise you as in joyful celebration, we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. From the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. similar way when supper was ended he took the chalice and giving you thanks he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying take this all of you and drink from it for this is the chalice of my blood the blood of the new and eternal covenant which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins do this in memory of me The mystery of Christ. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven. And as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, 
with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Petronell and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Benedict, our Pope Emeritus, and Ronald, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world, to our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to at their passing from this life. Give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, our glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other a sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Let us pray. May this heavenly mystery, O Lord, restore us in mind and body, that we may be co-heirs in glory with Christ, to whose suffering we are united whenever we proclaim his death, who lives and reigns forever and ever. We have a few announcements today. I'd like to invite you to be seated for a moment. This week, due to mandatory diocesan priest convocation, there will be communion services at 8 a.m. on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Next Saturday, October 2nd, St. Patronil Young Adults will be taking a trip to Our Lady of the Angels in Chicago to help with their outdoor food pantry. We will be passing out food to over 250 families in need. Transportation can be provided, but sign-up is required by this Tuesday, September 28th. Please contact Karina Greco for more information. She's in the parish office. Calling all altar servers. Our next training session will be Monday, September 27th at 5 p.m. here in the church. Young people in grades five, grades five through eight are welcome to sign up. Please be in contact with Deacon John Spezio to reserve your place. There he is. Let's talk to that guy. Okay. Please see today's bulletin for our mass schedule this week and for more information on these and other items of interest. And now we have a special treat. Sister Ruby, who will speak to us for a few minutes, has been visiting our parish for the last couple weeks. And here is Sister Ruby. Good morning. Thank you, Father Milota, Father Jan, and Deacon Jan, and Seminarian Joe, and for this opportunity to thank all of you, the good people of St. Petronel. I am Sister Ruby Arellano of the Sister Servants of the Visitation, the missionary congregation who received the great gift of so many beautiful baby blanket last winter from the Great Baby Blanket Project. I am so grateful for the opportunity to thank you in person, to congratulate you on your generosity to the poor families of the Philippines, especially during this time of pandemic, which so greatly affects all of us but more so the very poor need of our special care and attention. The isolation and misery of the poor has been compounded in so many ways by this terrible virus. But I can report to you that you at St. Petronel have made a bridge of love through the efforts of the great baby blanket project you made so many young families so very happy. We were able to give the blankets to the maternity ward at the provincial hospital and bring to the families during home visit and relief missions. Thank you for your missionary spirit. What you have done for the families of Borongan City where our mission serves is to give the gift of hope and solidarity. In these difficult times, it is a great comfort, especially to the young mothers and families welcoming child. To not feel alone, not to feel forgotten, but to know there are brothers and sisters here in St. Petronel, who in time of lockdowns, and disparate situations sent a gift of blessed baby blanket and holy medal for their child, like rose in heaven. Like centuries of the little flower, you prove you don't have to go far away, place to be a missionary. You can be an instrument of God's grace and accompany your brothers and sisters from Glenelyn, finding ways to reach out the, the periphery 
as Pope Francis said. In the month of Mary, October, I ask you to continue to be like our Mother Mary, the first missionary, and continue to, in this missionary spirit, to help the poor and those in need around you. Thank you also for all the school families of St. Petronel, athletes who donated their summer clothes for the children and families in the Philippines. Again, I congratulate you on your generosity and mission spirit. Magnificat, me, our mother of the visitation, bless and protect all the people of St. Petronel. And me, the light of your goodness, continue to shine and reach around the world. God bless you and thank you and happy Sunday. And thank you to Sister Ruby for your wonderful example of love to all those that you minister to in the Philippines and throughout your ministry as a religious sister. Thank you. And anyone who'd ever like to give a donation uh, to Sister Ruby, please feel free to just throw it in the collection. And say, just write Sister Ruby, R-U-B-I on there, and we'll know who to give that to. Let us stand together. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. The recessional hymn is found in the hymnal, number 599, God We Praise You, number 599. one. 